What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, Strengths and Sneakers. I'm a board certified psychiatrist bringing you the most up-to-date mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to the channel, I would love for you to subscribe and become a member of this community. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for your support. And today we're gonna to cover something that I think is extremely interesting. It's one of these things that when you see it, you get a little scared and you don't really know exactly what to do, but I'm gonna tell you all about it and how to work with it and treat it. And that is the topic of psychogenic polydipsia. Sounds kind of strange, but stay tuned. We're gonna cover everything about this disorder. So psychogenic polydipsia is an interesting occurrence and it occurs sometimes in different settings. So sometimes you can see this on the medical floors in, say, a consultation role. Sometimes you can see this in the emergency department. And other times you'll see it in the inpatient unit where I usually work. Now, let's do like a little bit of a case here and just kind of break it down from that perspective to help you guys understand what this psychogenic polydipsia is. So let's say a patient comes to me and they have an established diagnosis of schizophrenia. So I know that this person is a schizophrenic, most likely a chronic schizophrenic who, you know, who has been to the hospital before, has tried some treatment in the past. And the person's currently taking the medication Zoprazidone to treat their schizophrenia. Let's just say that's the scenario. Now, what's being observed is the person is constantly drinking. And let's say maybe their case manager observes this or their family member observes this. And the person is just constantly asking for a glass of water, one after another. And they don't really seem to be needing it. They don't look dehydrated. When you examine them, you know, they don't have dry mucous membranes. They don't look dehydrated. They don't have objective signs of dehydration, but they keep asking for water and they keep drinking it excessively throughout the day. So you might be thinking to yourself at this point, well, what's the harm in drinking a lot of water? Isn't staying hydrated a good thing? Isn't that a healthy behavior that everybody should be doing? Well, yes and no, right? I mean, obviously staying hydrated is important. Drinking enough water is important. But if you drink too much water in an excessive amount, it can actually kill you. And that's what we're kind of talking about here is we're talking about a person who comes in and then you run their basic metabolic panel and what do you find in their blood work? You find that their sodium's like 120, right? So their sodium's 120 and now you're starting to get worried and the panic is setting in. You're thinking, what is going on here? And why is this person always drinking? Why are they always saying they're thirsty? And why are they urinating so frequently? So that's the setting that we're dealing with. And I'm gonna to explain to you how we make the diagnosis of psychogenic polydipsia next. So I promised you guys I'd run you through the possibilities here, and there are a few possibilities, but one you have to consider in this scenario with the chronic schizophrenic patient, with the antipsychotic medication who's drinking but doesn't have any objective signs of dehydration, then you need to consider what's called psychogenic polydipsia or, or also known as primary polydipsia. And this was actually first described in the 1930s in patients with schizophrenia. And these patients, as you might have guessed already, drank an excessive amount of water resulting in low sodium levels. Now, the cause is really unknown. So nobody actually knows why patients with schizophrenia can sometimes develop this psychogenic polydipsia. But the patients ha may have, this is a possibility, may have an acquired defect in their hypothalamic thirst regulation. So the hypothalamus is responsible is a part of the brain that's responsible for regulating a lot of our bodily functions, one of those being thirst. So there might be some alteration in thirst regulation in patients with schizophrenia who develop this behavior or disorder, psychogenic polydipsia. Now, medications have also been associated with a worsening of psychogenic polydipsia, so this can also be a problem. And it could, and what we're thinking with the medications is that it's actually related to the anticholinergic effects. So many of the antipsychotics that patients are taking, or dopamine blocking medications, as I like to call them, have anticholinergic effects, and that can lead to a person feeling like they need to drink excessively. Now, examples of this might be medications like carbamazepine, chlorpromazine, oxcarbazepine, haloperidol, and valproate. So psychogenic polydipsia is actually quite common and it's usually associated with schizophrenia like I said but it can also occur in other psychotic disorders so other mood disorders, anxiety disorders as well and even some users of MDMA or ecstasy can develop psychogenic polydipsia. Now psychogenic polydipsia is a primary problem and the primary problem is the patient's drinking too much water. 
Very simple, right? And that when they're drinking that amount of water, it's going to dilute their serum or their blood and it's going to result in a low sodium level. So essentially this is just dilution. If I keep drinking water, my blood is going to become diluted and if my blood becomes diluted, the electrolytes that are in it are going to decrease. And when we're talking about a low sodium, we're defining that as less than 135 milli equivalents per liter for those of you who are wondering. And the person will also have, in addition to a low sodium, they'll have low serum osmolality, which makes sense because again, it's dilution. So they're gonna have low serum osmolality as well. And you can also look at their urine and lo and behold, the urine is also dilute, usually less than 100 milli osmoles per kilogram with a low urine sodium. So those are some of the ways in which you can start to run your labs and determine whether or not this is psychogenic polydipsia. So there are two other potential places where you can see polyuria, and those are the cases of hyperglycemia and or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now the key distinctions here, first of all in hyperglycemia, is that the water is drawn out by osmotic diuresis, and that's going to lead secondary to an excess, and that's secondary to an excess glucose in the urine. So that's one example. Now you're gonna identify this because you're gonna see that the person's hyperglycemic when you order their labs, and you're gonna see that that's a significant problem. You're also gonna run a UA and likely see that there's a lot of glucose in the urine as well. Now the key lab, like I said, for hypoglycemia and glucose present in the urine, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it's a little bit different. In this case, the brain secretes ADH, that's called antidiuretic hormone, and that's fine, no issues there. But the kidney doesn't respond to it. So the kidney is not gonna to respond to ADH, and in this case, the urine will be dilute, but the serum sodium level will be high, not low. So that's what will separate it from psychogenic polydipsia, is that you'll actually have a high serum sodium level, not a low one and that's gonna separate di nephrogenic diabetes insipidus from psychogenic polydipsia. So if you see a case of psychogenic polydipsia, your treatment of choice is going to be something called, very simple, called fluid restriction. All you're gonna do is try to prevent the person from drinking an excessive amount of water. That's gonna be your goal. And in this case, you're limiting them, if you're really curious, to 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters per day. So that's how much you want to limit them to, and this can actually be really difficult. Even in an inpatient setting, it can be difficult. And why? Because the person may need to be watched all the time. There's sources of water around the unit. For example, somebody can go to the bathroom sink and they can drink water from it. Somebody can even use the toilet and drink water from it. So there's ways of consuming water on the in the inpatient setting, in the emergency setting, on the medical floors that you know, could still cause you a problem and may require you to put the person on what we call a psychiatric one-to-one, -one, meaning somebody's in the room watching them at all times. Now, water restriction is actually, or fluid restriction rather, is usually enough to of a treatment. Usually this is good enough. In most cases, the person's sodium will correct itself and you won't necessarily need to do any other interventions because again, it's dilution that's causing the low sodium levels. But should the sodium remain low, then you might want to consider adding sodium chloride tablets one to three grams daily. In severe cases where the sodium drops below 120, the person can actually have a seizure, so that's gonna be a very serious medical complication, and in these cases, it's best to handle the fluid replenishment on the medical floor with 3% saline, where they can be closely monitored. You also must be careful not to correct the sodium too rapidly, and this is a classic medical school question, this is a classic thing to know if you're an internal medicine doctor, because it can result in the dreaded central pontine myelinolysis, which results in quadriparesis in some cases, right? So this could be very, very serious. This could be a significant mess up in the, on the part of the doctor if they were to correct the person too rapidly. And that's why we correct the sodium at a rate of no more than 10 millimoles per liter per 24 hours, or 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour. So this is why we do that. And if you're a psychiatrist, you're probably gonna wanna leave that to your internal medicine colleagues because that is their area of expertise. So I'm gonna hold the video there, guys. If you have questions or comments about psychogenic polydipsia, I would love to answer them. And now you know more than 99% of the population about this rare and interesting disorder.